This week on Wealth Track, a financial thought leader who takes on the bullish herd and shatters some Wall Street myths. Bianco researches James Bianco challenges the optimists on the Eurozone, U.S. economy and corporate profits and explains why Treasury bonds could offer protection in the battles ahead. Next on Consuelo Mac, Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to WealthTrack Premium subscribers. If you're interested, just go to WealthTrack.com for more information. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. Things are not always what they seem, especially when it comes to the economy and the markets. Case in point, recent statistics showing consumer credit increasing by the most in 10 years. The standard interpretation is this is a positive. Consumer spending accounts for about 70% of the economy. And the reasoning goes if consumers are borrowing, they are confident about the future and more willing to spend. Enter Jim Bianco and his team at independent research firm Bianco Research. They looked at who was actually doing the borrowing. It turns out the vast majority are individuals with student loans. According to Bianco, student loans have gone parabolic thanks to a 2009 government-mandated cut in student loan interest rates that expire July 1st. President Obama, incidentally, is pressuring Congress to freeze the rates again. As Bianco says, take out government-owned student loans, and there has been virtually no rebound in consumer credit since the Great Recession ended. Bottom line, the consumer is not rebounding nearly as much as credit figures have led us to believe. What other widely followed statistics and interpretations are suspect? That's where this week's guest comes in. He is financial thought leader James Bianco, president of the Chicago-based firm that bears his name. Bianco Research has been publishing its current and historical analysis and commentaries on the markets and money flows for more than two decades and is considered a must-read by many portfolio managers and traders. Bianco has a litany of issues where he is challenging the street's conventional wisdom, ranging from the sustainability of corporate profits to the riskiness of treasury bonds. I began the interview with one that's blown up recently and asked him why he has believed all along that the European crisis is far from over. Because the problem that caused it has not been fixed, and the problem is the elephant in the room. It's the euro. Uh, 17 countries using one currency doesn't work. All these countries have their own vested interests, and when they start banding together in using the same currency, you'll have what economists call the free rider effect. Germany is responsible, Germany does certain things, and the market applauds what Germany's doing. Portugal or Greece uses the same currency as Germany. They don't have to be responsible. They don't have to do the certain things, but they get to borrow, and they get to be perceived as the same thing as Germany, and they get themselves in trouble. How do you fix that? And the problem is, the way you fix it is you have to have all these countries come together in some kind of an agreement. That sounds nice, but really what we're talking about is Germany gets to tell Greece what to do. Greece gets to tell Portugal what to do. France gets to tell Italy what to do. And they fought wars once a generation for the last thousand years to prevent that from happening. So as long as we have the euro in its current structure, the problem doesn't go away. So why isn't this strategy of, of basically funding the financial system in Europe that the ECB is doing going to, you know, to work until the economies kind of stabilize. Why couldn't that work for, in, for a while? In theory it could, but let's remember the history of the euro. It started in 1999. It started during the bottom of the last recession and it went well until the next recession. It couldn't even make the next downturn without it, you know, having the problems that it had. The ECB, you're right, is trying to capitalize the banking system and they're all taking these short-term approaches. The, you know, the fair phrase on Wall Street now is kick the can down the road. They work for a while and then they don't, but at the end of the day, 
there are just going to be never-ending short-term fixes while we don't deal with the long-term problem. Now, we're trying to. There is austerity measures in place. There is agreements in place. There is reforms in place. They will take many years. But the problem we're also finding, and we saw it this spring with Spain, is that the minute that the crisis stops being white hot and only goes to maybe red hot, all of a sudden the lack of discipline's not there anymore. The Spanish promise that they're going to meet their budget deficit targets. They promise that they're going to try and rein in uh, the amount of uh, borrowing they have. Then the problem gets a little bit better, and then by March they say, you know what, well, we can't meet it now. Why? Because the, the situation maybe allowed them to get away with it, where they couldn't have said that in November because it would have been so bad for markets. And that's where the fear is, is that they're all promise when things are bad, we'll do whatever it takes to fix it, but when things get better, then they start backsliding. So that's why until you fix the euro, so you remove that, uh, that conflict of interest, you, we just kind of vacillate between it being a moderate problem and a severe problem. So in the meantime, as an investor, uh, what you're telling me is, so the kind of you know, macro-driven crises that have added so much volatility to the markets over the last several years, so that's kind of what we're in for? I think we are a little bit more of that. Europe itself is an economy of 300 million, like the United States. Its gross domestic product, if you will, is about the same as the United mm -hmm. States. And most of the uh, uh, countries in Europe right now are in recession. And a lot of them that aren't in recession are not looking very good at all. So that's going to weigh on world growth. That's going to weigh on the financial markets, whether you are an, uh, an international investor or whether you own a large multinational company that exports to Europe. That's going to continue to be a problem as we move forward from here. So I just don't see how it's going to wind up you know, getting nice and tidied up and put away anytime soon. Let's talk then about the impact that this could have on the U.S. economy because an another piece of common wisdom on Wall Street is that in fact the U.S. economy is improving and uh, which you know it certainly is from the from the recession that government stimulus has worked and uh, you know, unemployment is declining it's still not low enough but it's declining um, and you know and the markets are responding very positively because of that so is is this do you think in jeopardy our, our recovery and and the market you know rebound that we've seen it can be you're right that statistically <laughs> things are getting better and that we're moving along but as everybody likes to say and I'll throw myself in there too it's not good enough I've, I've used the analogy that you know one of my kids comes home from school and says, good news, I'm not getting D's anymore, I'm getting C's. Well, I'd like to hope for better than C's, but uh, I guess the C is better than a D, and that's what we have for the economy right now. The problem is, in order to get there, as you pointed out, we've needed massive government stimulus, we've needed extraordinary Fed action, and now we're seeing more of the same out of Europe. Let's call it what it is. It's central planning. Is what, it's a version of central planning. And whenever you get into an economy where you've got those big macro decisions being made by governments, it may work for a while, but history says if, they're, if they keep at it long enough, it will end in tears. And that's why I'm very nervous that we've got such heavy government involvement from either the fiscal side or the monetary side that we're not trying to get rid of. In fact, right now on Wall Street, the biggest talk is whether we're going to get QE3 later this summer or into the fall. We're going to get more of it, not Right, less. so quantitative easing three, which is the, the Fed would do something else, basically, to, mm -hmm. to make sure that the, that the financial system has liquidity and right. stimulus. Right. And quantitative easing is, is, has its host of problems. Yes, I understand that what the Fed did was necessary in 2008 and maybe 2009, and I won't criticize them that much for that period. But it's the middle of 2012 right now, and they haven't stopped. And the problem is, is that the unintended consequences from all of this massive amount of liquidity that they've injected and all of these programs that they have, I don't think we're beginning to understand it, and they're not stopping. They're adding on to them and maybe might even add on more later this year. So the unintended consequences would be what? Well, the big one that everybody worries about is inflation, and I would put myself in that camp too. Now, I said inflation, and everybody thinks, oh, he thinks 15% inflation. He thinks a rerun of 1980 or something like that. No, that's not what inflation is. Inflation can be 25 or 3% in a world where the Fed has promised to keep interest rates at zero through the end of 2014, and the Fed is maybe going to do more quantitative easing. So only 25 or 3% inflation would be very problematic. 
right now. And, and, and just so that people understand why, it, it means that the, you, the purchasing power basically of your investments or dollar or whatever are, are below the rate of inflation. So you're actually getting negative returns. I mean, is that exactly. the we basic are, problem? To use a fancy Wall Street phrase, we are in a low nominal growth world. In other words, earnings growth, the economy is growing. It's growing at very low rates, maybe three, maybe 4% on earnings growth or something to use as the one example. Well, if two and a half or 3% of that's gonna get eaten up by inflation, then the real growth that you're having after inflation is negligible. And the metaphor I like to use there is if 140 over 90 is hypertension, we're probably at like 136 over 88 in terms of the inflation hypertension. Yes, I can go back home from the doctor and say, I don't have hypertension. And I don't have much room to spare from it right now. So at 2% poor growth on inflation, we're getting very, very close to those levels. There's another uh, kind of deadline of approaching, uh, Jim, and, and it, you know, the U.S. is facing what's being called a, you know, a fiscal cliff. Mm -hmm. And they're saying the fiscal cliff is going to happen in 2013 after the election. And that's when all sorts of stimulus programs end and the Bush tax cuts expire and blah, blah, blah. And so, but again, people are saying, well, I'm going to worry about that next year when I've got a, you know, maybe the same president, maybe a new president, new Congress, whatever it is. You're saying that, that we are actually facing a very serious financial deadline that's going to happen before the election. And what is that? It's the debt ceiling. The, um, uh, the debt ceiling right now is looking like it's going to get hit around Labor Day. Uh, earlier this month, uh, the Treasury Department gave a, a briefing about the debt ceiling and kind of implied that it's going to get hit by around Labor Day. Now, what happens when it's reached the debt ceiling around Labor Day? The Treasury has extraordinary means that they could use. They can borrow against trust funds and they can do other accounting things to try and push the debt ceiling off past the election. Which they have done on a regular basis. Right. right. They have done and they can do it again. but. How much will they do? It becomes purely a political calculation at that point. If the debt ceiling gets um, hit by September and the administration decides it's in their favor to force a debt ceiling vote before the election, they can do that. And then we can have August 2011, five weeks or three weeks before the election. If they and, and, and remind us, August 2011, the market basically fell out of bed. Yes, it fell out of right. bed because we were threatening a default with the debt ceiling. And of course, the debt ceiling is not just you know, a, a bill that has one sentence. We will raise the debt ceiling to some higher number. It will include the tax cuts. It will include the spending cuts, the sequestration, the end of unemployment benefits. All of that gets wrapped up into this one thing called the debt ceiling. You don't separate those from, from the others. So we'll have that fight. Uh, possibly in October. So I'm hearing more uncertainty. I'm also hearing that, that another thing that happened last year around this same issue was the fact that the, the uh, credit rating of the U.S. Uh, got downgraded from a triple A to a double A. And in fact, you think that we could be in jeopardy for another downgrade, right, if we don't get our financial house in order? They've set the standard right now. Only S&P downgraded us from um, to AA plus. The mm -hmm. others, Moody's and Fitch, uh, still have the U.S. at, at AAA. But if we continue to punt on this issue and continue to not deal with it, then we can see more downgrades. And interestingly, it's the next downgrade that matters because a lot of people have argued, well, S&P downgraded us and the markets lost their mind for a couple weeks and then it was all over right, with. And the bond event. market never responded to it. Because technically, if you look at the way it works, What's the credit rating of the U.S.? It's AAA. Why? Because two of the three are still AAA, uh, and you take the majority rating. Well, the next one to go means that now the U.S. is no longer AAA. The next downgrade would actually have far more impact than the first downgrade. Very interesting. An another common uh, piece of wisdom on Wall Street right now is that corporate profits have never been better, never been healthier. And, um, and, you know, they cite that balance sheets are very strong, record levels of cash and, you know, in, uh, in, in corporations, uh, and also the fact that, uh, that we've had many consecutive quarters of, of increasing earnings. Mm -hmm. You're saying their earnings are not as good as they look. Why? Right. Again, to use my analogy from before, you know, we're looking at C-type earnings, not B or A. Additionally to that, if you look at the growth rate of earnings, the growth rate um, of earnings on a year-over-year -year basis is around 5%. Sounds impressive until you remember two things. Half that growth rate is Apple Computer. Apple is the dominant force in the market, and it's the dominant force in earnings. So the other 499 companies in the S&P 500, 
maybe 3% uh, growth. If I'm generous, I'll give them 4% growth. And headline inflation is running at 3%. That means after inflation, without Apple, the other 499 companies in the S&P 500 may be giving you 1% returns. This in an environment where the market's gone up 25% and everybody's convinced themselves that this is a sign that we've got great earnings and great earnings to come. Last off, on that is that the second quarter earnings estimates are for even less than the first quarter earnings estimates. So it doesn't look like it's about to turn around at least through the end of the summer. So what does that mean for the market? I think the market is pricing in a belief that earnings are going to continue to move higher and it may be disappointed by that. Two years ago, the growth rate on earnings was 15 or 20 percent. Now we're down to three or four and one after inflation and maybe zero after inflation for the next quarter. One of the most prevalent arguments for the bullish case um, for stocks uh, is, is the fact that stocks are, are the, the best alternative to just about anything else. I mean, they always compare it to the returns that you can get on treasuries, for instance. Uh, and in fact, that the large cap stocks, uh, you know, they pay really good dividends. What's your response to this kind of that they're, they beat all the other alternatives and that's the reason we should be investing in stocks? We all know that 11 years ago, the stock market was at the same level it's at now and we've compressed interest rates down to 1%. Well, a lot of people then will say, well, yes, that's true. Okay, I missed it that historically the bond market had been the place to be for the last 15 years. But now that we're at 3% 30-year rates or 2% 10-year rates, and we've got a 13 or 14 PE, the stock market has to outperform as we move forward from here. Uh, we heard this exact argument about 15 years ago in Japan when they had 2% rates, and we're still waiting for their market to outperform. So we've got one historical example where it may not work as, as well as we think. But the assumption that we're making here is that all of the problems we've discussed are going to get themselves revo resolved, the bond market is going to see higher yields, and the stock market is going to see better returns. My fear is that as we move forward from here, we wind up with more sideways in the bond mar stock market. We wind up with the bond market returning you 2%. It just gives you the coupon, but you don't lose any price. And if you start adding it all up, you wind up saying the bond market could very well stay competitive with the stock market as we move forward until we work out these problems. That is a radical thought. It is, <laughs> it is a radical thought. I mean, because everyone is saying, you know, the last thing in the world you want to be in is treasuries. Uh, it's right. the worst thing. And so that's probably why you, Jim, are looking at it and saying right. what's wrong with what they're saying. And let me make it a little more radical for you. Yeah. I agree with everybody who says that there's no value in the bond market. There isn't. That by most valuation measures, that treasuries look to be overvalued. That is true today, that was true three years ago, that was true five years ago, and I would argue it'll be true in two years hence. And the reason is we're failing to recognize who buys treasuries. I've heard this from people that say, you know, the bond market has no value and investors should stay away from it. Investors left treasury securities five years ago. All the measures of whether you look at mutual fund flows or whatever, they're not buying treasuries. Who buys treasuries? Central banks buy treasuries. The Bank of Japan, the Bank of China buys treasuries. The Federal Reserve buys treasuries with printed money that we call quantitative easing. The big banks buy them because the Fed has promised them zero financing costs. They borrow at zero from the Fed. They buy treasury securities. They hold them to maturity on a two or three year. And so they're making a nice spread. You, it, you right. said it's the carry trade. Right. right, that's the carry trade. They make a nice spread. But what I'm getting at is that who buys treasuries? The, the central banks and the large banks. And that dynamic may not change for a while. So these overvalued bond markets could very well stay overvalued for a long time. What would be the catalyst for an overvalued market to pop would be investors recognizing there's, there, that they own an overvalued security and running away. They already left. The catalyst at this point would be that the central banks change their mind, want to stop buying, and aren't interested if rates start rising. And I just don't see them doing that. They're going to continue to try and keep interest rates low around the world. And so they're going to stay there for a while. And I suspect people are going to find that bonds yields are going to stay low for a lot longer than they think. You've been saying that it is probably the worst stock pickers market in history that we've been through. Explain that. If you take the 500 stocks of the S&P 500 and you run a correlation of those to the index itself, mm -hmm. one or would be a perfectly correlated, they move exactly together, minus one would mean they move exactly inverse to each other. 
The correlations we've seen of the average stock to the S&P 500 is the highest ever. The all-time record was set actually six months ago, October of last year. The current levels of correlations, while down from the all-time high, are among the highest levels we've seen except for the last two years. So that means stocks, more stocks are moving in lockstep than they ever have. Right, and Wall Street has a phrase for this. We call it risk on and risk off because on risk on days, everything goes up and in risk off days, everything goes down. As, a, as an aside with that, we've also seen a couple of unusual days. In August of last year, we had a day where all 500 stocks were down in the S&P 500. That's the only day that's ever happened. Not even the crash of 87 did that happen. And we've seen a couple of days in uh, November and December of last year, 499 stocks were up on the day. Only one was uh, down on the day. And we've rarely ever seen something like that. That's the risk on risk off nature. So if you're a stock picker, and the market decides it's going to go up. Everything goes up. The bad ideas go up, the good ideas go up, the so-so ideas go up. It makes it very hard for you to differentiate yourself from the pack because all the stocks go up, all the stocks go down. And that's why it's been such a difficult stock picker's environment. And this isn't just day to day, as I've suggested. It's also gone on for months and even a couple of years. Now, I'll be clear, this is not the way the market should trade. This is a bad thing, because again, it's about markets allocating capital. And if we have high, these high correlations, they're not taking money away from bad ideas and giving money to good ideas. Either they all get it or they all don't get it. And it creates an inefficiency in markets, and it makes it difficult for the manager that picks individual securities to set up a portfolio that looks different from, say, just a chart of the S&P 500. What do I do with all of these changes that you're describing to me in the markets? I mean, you know, how do I make money in the stock market? The good news I would leave you with is that the bad part of it is already behind us. The 2008 decline where we thought that the world was going to come to an end has already occurred. So from here forward, we're going to have a tough slog where, like last year, last year the market was up 2%. It, it wasn't terrible, it wasn't great, and that's going to be kind of the, I think, the benchmark for what we're looking for as we go forward from here. Low returns, not a lot of opportunities to make a lot of money, but the good news may be not a lot of opportunities to get destroyed unless, of course, Europe falls completely apart. So within that environment, I would tone down my expectations a lot. I'm not looking for the 10 or 15 percent return. That era is gone. Uh, I'm not looking for the, 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 the portfolio of stocks that's going to really set me apart from everything else in this high correlation environment. That era is gone as well, too. Investing in the broad market, it'll be okay, but it won't give you a, a whole lot. If you're looking for an idea that might work, uh, it's been a favorite of mine for years, and that's gold. It's a speculative idea. I wouldn't put a lot in it. But in a world of uncertainty and in a world of a lot of problems, gold has, for the last several years, done very well. And I suspect it will continue to do better than average as we move forward. So is that your one investment, that we all should own some gold in a long-term diversified portfolio? Well, I think we should own some gold. But I also think that if we own stocks, we would probably want to be more towards the defensive end. High quality dividend names are, are an idea. I'm not afraid of owning some bonds because I don't think that you're going to see the yields go up and they will give you a stable amount of money. They may not make you a lot of money, but they won't lose you a lot of money as long as you stay away from long term bonds, maybe shorter term bonds. And if you're looking for a, a place where where are the least problems in the world, the least problems in the world might be in emerging markets except for China. Yes, they have a list of problems as well, too. Everybody does. But given the relative list of problems, I would probably more venture a guess towards emerging markets than I would towards developed markets at this point. So, Jim, your one investment for long-term diversified portfolio is? To have some gold. You need to have gold in an environment that we've been in the post-2008 period with the way that the Fed has been operating, with the way the government's been operating, and the problems in Europe. To have some gold, I think, has been and will continue to be a superior investment. Jim Bianco, it is such a treat to have you on Wealth Track. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. At the conclusion of every Wealth Track, we try to leave you with one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point don't be afraid to question the conventional wisdom, as Jim Bianco and so many of our Wealth Track guests do. With world economies still struggling to recover from the financial crisis, with unemployment rates in many European countries sky high, 
Spain's unemployment rate is over 23 percent. It's 50 percent for youth under the age of 25. Is it any wonder that incumbents are being thrown out and citizens are fighting austerity? Does it make sense to hold some so-called defensive investments like U.S. Treasuries and gold? Well, yes, it probably does. So don't be afraid to buck the conventional wisdom. I hope you can join us next week. Our guest will be another financial thought leader, Jason Trenert, economist, strategist, and co-founder of independent research firm Strategus Research Partners. He'll tell us why he is recommending top quality and, yes, even cash for individual investors. If you want to see our WealthTrack interviews before the pack, subscribers can do so 48 hours in advance. To sign up, go to our website, WealthTrack.com. You can also watch previous shows and find past one investment and action point recommendations there. And that concludes this edition of WealthTrack. Thank you for watching and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Research Affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market.